Hello everyone, I am the Bandit Kirby and welcome to my channel The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews and other deck techs. On this episode of The Brewery, I'll be discussing my take on a commander from the Adventures in the Forgotten Realms Commander Precons, Karazakar I Tyrant. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my CTG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description, it'll really help out the channel. The best way you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. For just $1, patrons get early access to certain videos on YouTube. In fact, patrons got a chance to watch this video earlier. You can also support my channel for free by simply liking, subscribing, and sharing which also helps out a lot. You can join my Discord server for free if you want to join the Commander Timer community. All pertinent links are down in the description. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Karazakar is a 5-5 Beholder for 3 generic, 1 black, and 1 red. It has 2 triggers abilities reliant on combat, one when you attack a player and the other when an opponent attacks another one of your opponents. When you attack a player, you tap one of the creatures they control and you goad it. Since you're tapping it down from an attack trigger, it's not the blocker step yet so the defending player can't use it to block, which is great because it makes it easier to attack into them. Goading their creature is also great because it'll help trigger the second ability. It is symmetric though since the opponent will also draw a card at the cost of one life. You can either use this politically or straight up take further advantage of the opponent drawing cards at the cost of life. Marisi Brick of the Coil is a commander with a similar effect but he goads all of the defending player's creatures when one of yours deal combat damage to them. This might seem more powerful since you're not goading the creatures one at a time. Marisi also prevents opponents from casting spells during combat. However, you don't get built-in card advantage from it. Choosing between the two is a matter of preference though, just like choosing between Blim, Comedic Genius, and Zedru the Great Hearted. In any case, Karasakar isn't the deck's only means of goading opponents' creatures. We might not be able to goad them all each combat, but Black Red has plenty of ways to go about it. Bloodthirsty Blade, Agitator Ant, Geode Rager, Goblin Racketeer, Grenzo Havoc Razor, Parasitic Impetus, Shiny Impetus, and Disrupt the Quorum all help us further goad opponents' creatures. Bloodthirsty Blade is slightly better than both Impetus because it's an equipment and thus won't leave the battlefield if the creature is attached to dies. That being said, each Impetus is useful since the red one gets us a treasure and the black one gains us 2 life which helps balance out the life we lose from Karasakar's second trigger. Agitator Ant can potentially go up to 4 creatures during our end step but those players have to choose to accept it. These creatures do get bigger though so we have to be careful if an opponent pumps it and then uses it against us in some future turn when it is no longer goaded. Goblin Racketeer can only goad one creature at a time and it has to attack. Unfortunately, it only has two toughness and it doesn't tap a creature down to protect itself. That being said, if there's a defenseless board to swing into, you can keep goading creatures there. Grenzo has a similar ability but it's whenever any creature we control deals combat damage to a player. However, there's two choices. We can either continue goading their creatures or we can impulsively draw from that player's library and use any mana to cast those spells. So he functions as further card advantage too. Geode Rager and Disrupt the Quorum help in goading all the creatures. Although the elemental can only do so per player and not all creatures, since the deck is running all fetch lands, then we can potentially do it to opponents twice in a single turn. Besides literally goading creatures, we can also force combat other ways. Cardor Doom Scourge achieves this. Whenever he enters the battlefield, all creatures your opponents control attack each other. What's great about his trigger is that it's not goading those creatures, he hits opponents. So if they later play any creatures with haste, they still have to attack someone else each combat. In a sense, this is slightly better than Disrupt the Quorum, and then you have a 4-3 body afterwards to attack or chum block with. He also has an ability that drains opponents for 1 life whenever an attacking creature dies, which is also pretty busted in this deck that's forcing combat via goading and other using other methods. Speaking of which, Magnetic Web, Goblin Spymaster, and War's Toll are some more forced attack effects. Unfortunately, we do have to be careful with these since the affected opponents can still attack us. They're just forced to attack. Later on, we'll see how the deck can mitigate getting attacked. So while these force attacks, we have to be a worse board state to attack into, thus forcing opponents to go elsewhere or lose their attackers. Magnetic Web is an interesting card because it's slowly picking off which creatures can attack and block. But once multiple creatures start getting magnet counters, whenever any of them attack, all the others have to attack as well. So if we go to a creature with a magnet counter on it, it'll drag along all the other creatures with one as well. It also forces blocks which makes it great at potentially getting rid of creatures too. War Soul is especially taxing since it also forces them to use all of their mana from lands and can't keep any lands for future turns, preventing any responses. Zancha's Sleeper Agent and Rite of the Raging Storm also help trigger Karasakar's card draw ability via forced attack. Zancha being forced to attack a different player will definitely trigger Karasakar, but we can also draw cards by paying 3 each time. Any opponent can do that too at the expense of their controller. Granted, we're having opponents draw plenty of cards with Karasakar and other effects, but naturally we'll take advantage of that which we'll soon see how. The enchantment also gives each opponent a force attacker that can't swing at us. This enchantment alone should be able to trigger Karazakar thrice each turn around the table, getting us essentially 4 cards per turn. 
We can also maximize the fun at our opponent's expense by making the most of these forced combat situations. For one thing, we can make it harder to block and thus easier to be taken out. Void Windward, Magistrate's Veto, and Rogue's Passage help in this regard. The Windward not only prevents creatures with even casting costs from blocking, but also prevents opponents from casting potentially half of their deck. If their commander has an even casting cost and is still in the command zone, you can cackle maniacally when resolving Void Windward. Magistrate's Veto is amazing against control decks since it prevents white and blue creatures from attacking. This might seem like a dead card if none of your opponents are playing white or blue, but that's not something we would expect in so many games. So it is worth including here for potentially preventing around one of three creatures from blocking. The land might seem a bit costly at 4 mana and tapping, but it doesn't take up a slot on the deck. It also forces us to attack with our own 5 power commander, which in and of itself can be a great clock. Frontier Warmonger doesn't outright prevent blocking, but it does make attackers harder to block by gaining the menace. This also helps us as well since it makes it harder to block our creatures and we can thus potentially go even easier with Karazakar out. Taking further advantage of these forced attacks is cards like Vengeful Ancestor, Crown of Doom, and Calculating Lich. Keep in mind that Vengeful Ancestor only counts creatures that were literally goaded and not forced to attack by other means. But that's fine since the deck has so many literally goaded effects that it's going to make attacks quite painful, especially when it itself can goad creatures whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks. Crown of Doom introduces Hot Potato to the game if opponents don't want to get hit so hard from attackers. This helps in taxing their turn as well since they have to pay 2 mana each time to give it away. Calculating Lich not only takes 1 life away per creature attacking one of our opponents, but it's also a 5-5 with built-in menace, which is great for swinging in with too. Sword of Discord, Bitter Feud, Fiendish Duo, and Wound Reflection further amplify the pain. The first two has us choose two players which are naturally going to be two of our opponents. The Sower makes it each combat brutal so it has an opponent lose life whenever another one does, so it's great at dealing against that pillow for player no one can attack into. The latter two double the pain received. The doubles literally double the damage our opponents receive, while Wound Reflection takes that much life away at the end of their turn. Even if nothing else gave the opponent damage that turn, simply attacking while Karazakar is in play means they'll lose life from drawing their card, thus triggering the enchantment at the end of the turn. Master of Cruelty takes advantage of swinging into a defenseless board. If an opponent is tapped out due to forced attacks, we can then swing in and take their life down to 1, making them die the next time they attack if Karazakar is out. Not only that, but this demon having first strike and death touch makes it quite the de attack deterrent for those ungoaded creatures. Let's see how else we can take advantage of the mayhem happening across the table. Mind's Eye allows us to draw into even more cards since opponents are not only drawing in their draw step, but whenever they attack each other as well. With enough mana we can draw even deeper than just Karazakar alone. Ivory Tower further synergizes by helping us buff the life loss with some life gain. It might not seem like much at first, but when we reach our upkeep after drawing 3 or more cards before then, we might be gaining enough life to completely null the life loss from Karazakar's triggers. Twilight Prophet also helps in that regard if we have the city's blessing. We might whiff and reveal a land, but the deck has plenty of beefy spells, so revealing any of those can help us recover some life as well as further hurting our opponents. It's also a flyer which can help with triggering Karazakar by sending it on the offensive. Relicary Tower is a given with how many cards we're going to be drawing in any given game with this deck. It doesn't enter tapped and gives colorless mana in a two-colored deck, so it's not going to color screw us anytime soon. As for doubling down on Karazakar's triggers to draw even more cards, Strionic Resonator and Lithoform Engine lets us still redo that. The best trigger to copy though is the first one since it allows us to tap down and go two creatures per attacked player instead of just one. Even then, the deck has plenty of other triggered effects, so they're pretty useful outside of our commander. Lithoform Engine is also quite the Swiss Army knife, so it can have other uses here as well. Hum of the Toast also doubles our commander triggers by literally doubling our commander. Multiple copies of Karazakar means multiple tap and go triggers, as well as multiple card draw triggers. Just be careful with this one since we do lose life whenever the second ability triggers. Our opponents will also be drawing into a ton of cards, which means finding responses. So keep that in mind before then. Aggravated Assault, Hellkite Charger, Morag Fury of Akum, and Port Razor gives us multiple attack triggers by giving us multiple attack steps. As is, the deck doesn't currently have any infinite mana engines, but if it did, you could win the game that way with Aggravated Assault and Hellkite Charger giving you infinite attack phases. But even without infinite mana, getting at least 1 or 2 extra combats will do a ton of work. Especially playing and then cracking a fetch land with Morag on the battlefield. That's not only 2 extra combat phases, but 2 more opportunities to pump our attackers by plus 1 plus 0 each time. Port Razor has the potential of giving us 3 extra combat phases each turn so long as it deals combat damage to a different player each time. If our opponent's creatures are tapped down because they were forced to attack and don't have vigilance, then this is definitely doable. Getting an emblem from Zariel, Archduke of Avernus, is yet another way of getting an extra combat phase. 
If you're able to get even more emblems, you get even more combat faces since they're added after the first one. So two emblems give you two additional combat faces after the first one, etc. Her other abilities are so useful as well since the first one pumps our creatures and also gives them haste. Her second ability creates a chum blocker or potential attacker if all we want is to trigger Karaza card. Dolmen Gate helps us protect those attackers ensuring we're always sending attackers to opponents to trigger Karaza card and or apply further pressure on our opponent's life totals. Since damage is prevented to our attackers, we can swing in with any creature and them being blocked won't matter since they won't die and Karaza card triggers on attack and not on combat damage. For the few times we might find ourselves against other aggressive decks which we can't completely goad, we have to then prevent ourselves from being on the other side of a beatdown. Crawl Space, Kazool Tyrant of the Cliffs, and Koskin Falls are some Pillow Fort effects we can use to help with that. The enchantment does require us to tap down a creature doing our upkeep, but that isn't such a drawback in this kind of deck, especially when Pillow Fort effects are still few and far between in red and black. Ember Wild Captain and Cunning Rhetoric, also politically disincentivized our opponents from attacking us. If we're the Monarch, the Captain will deal even further damage to our opponents already weakened from opposing attacks and losing life. Cunning Rhetoric has us steal their top card which is a lot of players will definitely be against. But even if they don't care, then it's more cards for us to play, essentially functioning as pseudo draw. Curse of Disturbance and Curse of Opulence helps incentivize attacking a specific opponent. Opponents might be teaming up together to distribute the pain and survive as much as they can. But cursing particular opponents with these might either make opponents attack them for value or not attack them to not give them value, which in any case would weaken the one they're not attacking into. It also favors us as well since we'll reap the rewards of attacking the cursed players. So it's win-win-win. Wall of Shadows and Sentinel are included for when opponents do manage to attack us. These little known blockers originally printed in Legends ironically find the best home here since that set was based on the developer's D&D sessions, pretty fitting for a D&D legendary creature like Karazakar. So long as the attackers don't have Flying or Trample and in Sentinel's case don't have Double Strike, they can pretty much deal with any straggler that breaks through our defenses. With both of these out along with Crawl Space, we just simply have to ensure that we're tapping down and goading opponents' Flyers, Tramplers, and Double Strikers. Blasphemous Act and Damnation help keep it real not only when the board gets too full of creatures we can't all goad, but also for when it comes down to just us against the last opponent standing. If we're their final opponent, goading their creatures does nothing. So this helps us reset the board when it's down to just us against an opponent with a larger board present. They're super important here. Fortunately, we dig so deep through our library in a game that we can probabilistically have them in hand for when the time comes. Kurkeep, Blinkmoth Nexus, Inkmont Nethys, and Mistress Factory and Mutavolt also help in this regard since these lands can help provide us creatures after we wipe the board. And not just when we wipe the board either. Even though Cobalts of Kurkeep have zero power, we just need to assign them as attackers to trigger Karaza card. So this land will always give us the means of getting those attract triggers. They can also function as chump blockers in a pinch too. As for the man lands, they might only tap for colorless, but they can turn into a creature for just one mana and they don't enter the battlefield tapped. The deck is running Blood Moon though which would make these including these man lands moot, but this is enough to shut down so many decks which is so good for us in the long run. It also helps slow down those players running multicolored decks which makes it easier for us to take over the game especially since they won't be able to do much. Vandal Blast helps us deal with artifact based pillow fort effects but it can also remove our opponent's mana rocks which also slows them down. Even though we're forcing combat and making our opponents lose life via many methods, the fact remains that everyone's drawing cards off of our commander. So this, along with Blood Wound, helps keep a lot of decks in check. Lightning Greaves, Swift Foot Boots, Whisper Silk Cloak, and Champion's Helm help protect our commander from targeted effects. While these cards tend to be ubiquitous in the format, the cloak in particular does a lot in this deck since we want our creatures to survive combat. So making one of them unblockable will almost surely guarantee that. Equipped to our commander can also get some commander damage in. Combine it with Champion's Helm, which would have to be equipped first as a Cloak Clack Shroud, and our commander becomes a 3 turn clock. We can also synergistically accelerate our mana output via the deck's mean and aggressive strategy. This is important since we're drawing into a ton of cards so we want to make the most of it. Sword of Hearth and Home and Sword of the Animus ramp us basic land when the equipped creature attacks. The former needs to connect but not the latter. The sword also gives some of the synth protection as well as a buff. There isn't a lot of creatures that can be blinked for value but at least blinking any of our tapped attackers allows them to be untapped and ready to block. If you have card or art though, then blinking him each combat means that we sort of guard the entire board which is possibly the best thing you can do with these two cards in the deck. British Heart is some much needed land based ramp, at least it's on a creature so we can use it to attack, block and then respond with ramping. So it's not just for the ramp although it kind of is. Nikto Shrine to Nyx help us cast our spells even though the deck is too colored since there's a lot of permanence in this deck. It doesn't take up a slot and can do a lot of work, especially when it comes to casting huge spells like Exsanguinate. Not only can this be used to increase our life total if we're drawing too many cards off of Kazarak's triggers, but it can also finish off the table if they've been attacking each other for a couple of turns. 
As for the rest of the ways we're accelerating our mana generation, Soul Ring, Mana Crypt, Mana Vault, Talisman of Indulgence, Arcane Signet, and Recto Signet are obviously included and don't really require any further explanation, then land based ramp isn't that easy to come by in decks that don't run green. The rest of the deck is just the rest of the lands. The deck's running all Lady Fetch lands, Battlelands, Blood Crypt, Canyon Slop, Smoldering Marsh, Sulfurous Mire, Dragon Skull Summit, Luxury Suite, Command Tower, and Ancient Tomb, as well as 5 of each basic land. As with all of my deck techs you don't need Battlelands, the more expensive fetch lands or mana crypt if you aren't playing online, don't already have them or don't want to proxy them. You can easily swap them out for budget substitutes and the deck will still run just as well. This brew is just an idea of how to build around Karasakar the Eye Tyrant. Although I took a lot of ideas in terms of what's possible with goading and forced combat from my Marisi Brick of the Coil and Thantis to War Reaver decks, Karasakar is a different take on the forced combat archetype, especially since you have the potential of drawing into a ton of cards. So while it has one less color than these previously mentioned commanders, it makes up for it with its card draw. If you're interested in the decklist of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me, and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG player affiliate link, that also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of the Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am the Kirby, and happy brewing.